on World News Tonight. Scottish send-off. The people of Scotland move in single file to pay their final respects to Queen Elizabeth. Retaking victory. Ukraine reclaims enemy-occupied territory, turning the tide on the conflict despite countless setbacks. Living hell. Thousands of displaced victims suffer at the hands of pests and malnutrition as floods continue to ravage Pakistan. And dazzling stars. This year's Emmy blasted off with special appearances from popular artists. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. The entirety of Scotland are now paying their respects along with the royal family as Queen Elizabeth lies in state at St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh following a solemn procession along the Royal Mile. Emerging from her palace, bagpipes in the air and draped in the royal standard of Scotland, Queen Elizabeth II beginning her final journey home to England. The Queen's coffin, adorned with flowers from her beloved Balmoral estate, dahlias, pine fir, and her favorite sweet peas, placed in the back of a hearse for a somber procession from her Holyrood house to St. Giles Cathedral. King Charles III, in full military regalia, solemnly marching behind his mother's casket, uphill through Edinburgh. Mourners packing the Royal Mile, hoping for one final glimpse of their longest reigning monarch and a first look at their new king. I'm very happy to have been here and I'm happy for her that she died in Scotland, where she loved. King Charles flanked by his siblings, Princess Anne, Prince Edward and Prince Andrew, noticeably marching in civilian attire. Heckler pulled from the crowd and arrested by police after shouting at Prince Andrew, who was stripped of his royal titles in the wake of sexual misconduct allegations and his close ties to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Guarding the Queen's hearse, the Royal Regiment of Scotland, and right next to them, sporting those large feathers, the Royal Company of Archers, the King's personal bodyguards, when in Scotland. The procession then turning into the west facade of the cathedral, built in the 14th century. Inside, the voices of a choir. The queen led to the center of the church, where she will lie in state for the next 24 hours. The crown of Scotland placed on her coffin. Local leaders joining the royal family for an elaborate ceremony. So we gather to bid Scotland's farewell to our late monarch, whose life of service to the nation and the world we celebrate, and whose love for Scotland was legendary. Following the ceremony, the rush to see the monarch inside and witness history. Some standing in line for more than nine hours. The king departing St. Giles to a muted round of applause. <laughs> Meeting the first minister of Scotland behind closed doors before addressing Scottish Parliament for the first time as monarch. Dressed in a traditional kilt, the king paying homage to the land his mother loved so dearly. Through all the years of her reign, the Queen, like so many generations of our family before her, found in the hills of this land and in the hearts of its people a haven and a home. The speech, His Majesty's second of the day. In London, King Charles delivering his first speech to British Parliament, making him the only monarch to do so before the cameras. I am deeply grateful for the addresses of condolence by the House of Lords and the House of Commons, which so touchingly encompass what our late sovereign, my beloved mother, the Queen, meant to us all. Beneath the vaulted ceiling of Westminster Hall, the King paying tribute to his mother 
and vowing to uphold the principles of a constitutional government. She set an example of selfless duty, which, with God's help and your counsels, I am resolved faithfully to follow. The Queen's children beside her coffin tonight in Scotland for the ceremonial vigil of the princes. Before her devoted public was let inside the cathedral walls, thousands honoring the Queen in the breathtaking landscape that came to be her second home. Ireland is now anxious following the passing of the Queen. The region fears friction might be inevitable between the nationalists and those who oppose the monarchy. Nevertheless, uh, mourners continue to gather and pay their respects to the late Majesty. Northern Irish loyalists laid flowers by a huge mural of a young Queen Elizabeth in a fiercely British corner of West Belfast, looking back at what they saw as a glorious past. Really, really sad. It's like it's if you've lost your granny or somebody belonging to you. A few hundred metres away, across steel and concrete peace walls, many Irish nationalists reacted to her death with indifference or polite sympathy. Elizabeth was queen for 70 of Northern Ireland's 100 years of history and for all of three decades of the Troubles, in which more than 3,000 died in sectarian fighting. Loyalists who want to keep the region under British rule remain among the royal family's most devoted subjects. Sinn Féin, the former political wing of the Irish Republican Army, horrified many loyalists in May by securing the largest number of seats in the regional parliament for the first time. The party said a referendum on letting Northern Ireland join a united Irish state should be held within a decade. Doug Beattie is leader of the second largest unionist party, the Ulster Unionists. If you look at it, she understand what was happening, the contemporary changes to the world, and she moved with them. Uh, and I think Charles has the ability to do that as well. So in every corner of the kingdom, he's going to have a very particular issue that he's going to have to deal with. Of course, here in Northern Ireland, it's very acute because we come from uh, a divided society. A potent symbol of the Union, the Queen in her later years became a major force for reconciliation with its Irish nationalist foes. Her state visit to Ireland in 2011 was the first by a monarch in almost a century of independence. Irish nationalist columnist Brian Feeney. Her visit then was a major watershed, um, particularly when she went to the Garden of Remembrance and led a wreath to the men who actually rebelled against her grandfather in 1916. So there was a, a lot of stuff washed away by the Queen's visit in 2011. While some Irish nationalists in bars reportedly cheered the news of the Queen's death and some fireworks were heard in Belfast, the reaction across nationalist areas was largely muted. Sinn Féin called on supporters to be respectful and said they were looking forward to working with Charles. While most of the world mourns the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, some former British colonies are demanding reparations as a form of apology for the lasting damage inflicted upon the regions and its people from previous rulers. In former British colonies around the world, flags at half-staff, including in India, once part of the sprawling British Empire. I remember her in such a way that she's dressed like our mother's figure. The Queen often visited Britain's colonies and former colonies. Today, there are 14 Commonwealth realms where the King is still recognized as the head of state, including here in Jamaica. Jamaica historian Cliff Hughes says this country's beautiful shores hold an ugly past, slavery. The enslaved forced to the West Indies by the Royal African Company. They harvested sugar known as green gold. It built England, it built the streets, it built the big businesses. The new king, Charles III, now inherits that legacy. When slavery was finally abolished, those who were the enslavers were paid 20 million pounds, which was 40% of Britain's annual budget. Which is why reparations remain a hot topic. When the now Prince and Princess of Wales visited Jamaica in March, there were protests and demands for an official apology. Some now hope that comes from the new king.
And as Prince Charles ascended the title of king, his children moved up the monarchial ladder as well. All eyes are now on Prince William, the royal who the public believe is the most promising heir due to his very open stance of moving their reign with the changing times. Following the death of his beloved granny and the accession of his father, King Charles, Prince William now finds himself next in line to Britain's throne. He is the heir apparent, with his eldest son, George, second in line. While the Queen was still alive, Prince William and his wife, Kate, routinely emerged in polls as the second most liked royals after the reigning monarch. And many view him as a hopeful symbol of the modern monarchy. An awful lot rests on William's shoulders for the future of the monarchy. So let's take a closer look at Prince William's role now. After his grandmother died, Prince William, a.k.a. the Duke of Cambridge, was made the Prince of Wales by his father, King Charles, a title he himself held since he was nine years old, and one which he later shared with his late wife, Diana. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations, helping to bring the marginal to the centre ground, where vital help can be given. In the days after the Queen's death, William has been much in evidence. He was picked to witness his father's historic accession and proclamation ceremonies. And to the surprise of many, he strode out with his brother Harry and their partners to greet mourners at Windsor Castle, a sign they may have overcome their recent estrangement. In 2017, Prince William announced he would step down from his job as an air ambulance helicopter pilot to become a full-time royal. Before that, he served in Britain's armed forces from 2006 until 2013. The prince has since shaken off the work-shy Wills nickname British tabloids once gave him, and William and Kate have enjoyed highly positive media coverage in recent years as one of the world's most glamorous couples with Hollywood star appeal. Charles Ray is a former royal correspondent at The Sun. But William is the key person because William is going to be king one day and he, uh, when you see him and when he has a chat with the media and when he speaks to the media, it's all very friendly. And of course he's got one of the greatest weapons on his side is Catherine. You know, it's, she's fantastic. <laughs> William has also received much praise for his work on mental health, homelessness and the environment. Hello, Prince William. Hello, Lady Gaga. I am a very big fan of what you've done with Heads Together and hashtag it's okay to say. The couple's recent tour of the Caribbean was widely regarded as a bit of a slip up. They faced protests over Britain's imperial past and criticism that some of the tour had echoes of a colonial throwback. If there was a scandal around William, you know, it would it would not uh, it would not go down well, you know, with the country or the market. I mean, he is he's the last of the Mohicans, basically, to be perfectly honest. You know, we, we just wouldn't want to have any bit of scandal, uh, you know, uh, surrounding him. And yes, I think an awful lot rests on William's shoulders for the future of the monarchy. <laughs> According to the Sunday Mirror newspaper, the visit prompted William and Kate to rethink how the monarchy should look, with the couple saying they wanted to be known by their names and not their titles. Some have recently suggested the monarchy should have skipped a generation, and William, not Charles, should now be king. William has expressed a desire to ensure the monarchy moves with the times to stay relevant. And in 2016, he praised his granny for being the best role model for the job. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now, battle lines are being redrawn in Ukraine as Russia's invasion marks 200 days. Ukrainian forces staging a massive counteroffensive in the northeastern region have taken back large swaths of territory previously under Russian control. Marking 200 days since the beginning of Russia's full scale invasion, Ukraine has staged a massive counteroffensive against Russian forces. 
In the highly anticipated counterattack, Ukrainian forces have successfully taken back large areas of territory in the northeastern region of Kharkiv, which had previously been under Russian control. In a video address, Ukrainian President hailed the latest developments, adding the country's forces were successfully continuing their active operations in several areas. Up to now, the armed forces of Ukraine have liberated and taken control of about 30 settlements in the Kharkiv region. In a number of villages in the area, activities to check and secure the territory are ongoing. Gradually, we take over new settlements. Everywhere we return the Ukrainian flag and safety to our people. Ukrainian authorities say joyful residents return to former frontline villages on Monday. The country's general staff said that people are crying and joyful. Thanks God we have it. We are grateful to our armed forces, our boys, and the courage of our heroes. Ukraine will prevail. I'm very happy and hopeful. I'm praying to all the gods of the world for us to win and for things to calm down, at least. After thousands of Russian troops pulled back from the region, leaving behind ammunition and equipment, Moscow fired missiles at power stations on Sunday, resulting in blackouts in Kharkiv and the surrounding regions. Russian strikes continued throughout Monday, with Ukrainian authorities denouncing the attacks as retaliation against civilian targets for Moscow's military setbacks. The insufferable conditions in Pakistan only seem to amplify when night falls. Hundreds of thousands of victims make futile attempts at protecting children from mosquitoes and water poisoning. Pakistanis sheltering at this relief camp after historic flooding say there's little relief to be found at night. There are too many mosquitoes and only a few nets in sight. Electricity is also in short supply. In the hardest hit Sin province, Zulfikar Silanji described it in apocalyptic terms. We spend each night with great difficulty. Every night is like a doomsday for us. The mosquitoes are biting and the children cannot sleep due to them. The children are falling sick due to the mosquito bites and the hospitals here are not able to treat every disease from mosquito bites. Floods from record monsoon rains and glacial melt in the mountainous north have affected 33 million people and killed almost 1,400. Water submerged nearly a third of the country, with Sindh receiving 466 percent more rain than average. Both the government and the UN Secretary General have pointed the finger at climate change. Last week, Antonio Guterres said he had never seen climate carnage on this scale. Those staying in the camp say children are struggling to cope. There is no drinking water here, and we are drinking the flood water. The children are falling sick. There are lots of mosquitoes here, and the children cry the whole night. We continue to fan the children the whole night, but yet it is difficult for them to sleep. In the day we are under the hot sun, there is no proper shade, neither any arrangement of food nor water here. This is what we are facing. UN agencies have begun work to assess the country's reconstruction needs, with Guterres calling for global financial help. So far, the damage is estimated to be in the tens of billions. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Growing wildfires in Canada's westernmost province, British Columbia, prompted air quality warnings and evacuations orders, including the evacuation of a camp housing workers of the Trans Mountain Oil Pipeline expansion project. U.S. President Biden touted a cancer moonshot initiative to create new life-saving cancer treatments. He referred John F. Kennedy's moonshot speech urging Americans to lead in space exploration, which the former president gave 60 years ago today. A fire at an electric bike showroom in India killed at least eight people and sent seven more to hospital. Police said at a time of growing concerns about safety of the vehicles. A senior official at South Africa's struggling energy utility ESCOM has said it could take 12 months or so to end recurring power cuts despite new measures pledged by President Cyril Ramaphosa. 
The Netflix original K-drama series Quit Game has made history at the 74th Primetime Emmy Awards. Director Wong Dong Yuk is bringing home the outstanding directing for a drama series honor while lead actor Lee Jong Jae has clinched the trophy for best actor in drama. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we are leaving you tonight with stars lighting up the red carpet at the Emmy Awards. Thank you for joining us again. Stay safe and have a good night.